Chapter Two of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Reel. Los Angeles, California, May Eleventh. Dear Clara Bell, at last I am in California, where all the moving pictures are made. Of course, you received my souvenir postal cards of the orange groves and the old mission I sent you, but this is the first time I had a chance to take my pen in hand and write you a letter. I have been so busy before this, but now my feet are so tired, I just got to stay home to rest. I guess Ma was right when she told me not to get sevens. I've been wearing eights. I have been to several studios, but as yet have not selected the ones in which I shall work. I have not seen any celebs yet, as they work all day, and Ma told me not to go out alone nights in the Wild West. Los Angeles is a funny town. Everybody is trying to sell you something. A conductor on a streetcar tried to sell me a ticket to vote for a queen of something, and every night in the place where I eat, the firemen and policemen come in and try to sell me votes, too. Oh, I must tell you about the funny places to eat. Dearie, you stay close to the eating house, for a waitress would starve to death out here. Everybody waits on herself. I hope to die if this is not the truth. You go in, grab off a big tray, and then run around and find what you want to eat. But you don't have to wash your own dishes. Los Angeles is much larger than Dubuque, or Galena, and everyone that lives there says it will soon be the biggest city in the world. They believe it, too. Most of the moving pictures are made in a suburb called Hollywood, and after looking up the address of the studios, the day after I got here, I went out. It's towards the Pacific Ocean. I got the shock of my life when I stepped off the streetcar. Down the street came a man on horseback, like sixty, and turning in the saddle every minute to shoot back over his shoulder. Back of him came some cowboys shooting furiously. I hollered and ran up a porch. Some men standing in a little group to one side off the street, I hadn't saw them before, begun to laugh. Clara Bell, they were taking a scene of a moving picture. They were taking it with a big box on three legs and a man who turned a crank at one side of the box. A little further on, I saw a girl being kidnapped in an automobile, but this time I saw the man with the box, so I knew no fond mother was losing her darling. They take moving picture scenes on the street and in vacant lots around here all day long. I saw three different kind of murders before I had gone two blocks. I will tell you how they go to it in my next. I went to what they told me was the studio, but it was not a studio at all like what we read about in the Chicago Sunday papers. There were no paintings or divans or mirrors. Just a big old place with a high board fence around it and a little place marked office in one corner. I tried to peek through a crack in the fence, but could not see anything. Finally, I followed some people into the office and saw a little window marked employment. I went up to the woman standing behind the window and asked to see the director. That is what the Mary Pickford lessons told me to ask for. The lady said, Which director do you care to inspect? I said, Any. Then she said, Dearie, take a tip from me and run right out of here. None of our directors have been fit company for a wildcat for two weeks, and as it's raining, they're getting worse. I told her that I was willing to accept an engagement in moving pictures if the salary was large enough, and she told me she would take my name and telephone me when they had heard from the New York office on my proposition. How long does it take to get an answer from New York, I wonder? I went to several other studios, and they were just alike, except that I don't believe they have to write New York when engaging a star. In one place, I got to talking to several girls, and they told me all the family gossip about the actors and directors. We'll tell you all about it pretty soon, and you will certainly have some idols cracked. But those sevens hurt, so now I must go to bed. Lovingly yours, Molly. P.S. I carried my Mary Pickford diploma to show the directors like the book said. But as yet, I had not been even near enough to a director to have thrown it to him. Molly. Hollywood, March 17, 1915. Dear Clara Bell, Dearie, I have been in a picture. And who do you think I played opposite? J. Warren Kerrigan. Honest. Though, of course, he was on the opposite side of the street, and I was in a howling mob on the other side. He is the grandest man, and he actually spoke to me. He is a dear, so full of sympathy. He said to me, he said, Dearie, if you don't stop acting so hard, you will strain something. Right during rehearsal it was, and Mary and Stella, two girls I met, heard him. I was just all over confusion, and I could feel myself blush a foot under the skin. When I got home that night, I bought all the souvenir postal cards of him I could find. I have not signed up with any company as yet, but you can bet when I do, Jack is going to be my leading man. 
while I was trying to decide which company to go with, one of the girls where I board, a nice place, and only six a week, took me out to Universal City, and I went on in a scene, right in the same picture with Jack. That Universal City is sure a nice place. You go out to Hollywood on the streetcar, and then take a jitney over Cahuenga Pass to the city. A jitney, my dear, is an automobile you can ride in for a nickel. And I have just had the most delightful times motoring about, here and there. And if it wasn't for the big signs on the front end, people would think it was your own car. And would you believe it? In the restaurant I ate only two tables from King Baggett's. He's got the loveliest gray eyes. At the city, it is all white, like an amusement park. They have got a hospital and a big restaurant where you eat, and buildings where big revolving things dry the film, and miles and miles of stages for the people to act out on. The scenes are put on the stages like they are in theaters. They don't use real houses at all. All the scenes in one set, that's what they call the rooms, are taken at one time. One man told me he got thrown out of a door in one scene and didn't expect to land on the other side for a week yet. That must be what the doctors call suspended animation that I've been reading about. It is funny how conceited some of these actors and actresses are, Clara Bell. Everyone thinks everyone else is getting by on a mistake. I heard a man here say that he was the only director in the world who could make real funny pictures. How about those there Keystones and Charlie Chaplin? A fellow asked. Oh, they're pretty good, too. I never knock people when they are doing the best they can, he said. Don't you think that man had a large heart to be so kind to the other poor directors? They were awful glad to see me when I got out there, although I did not show my diploma or give my real name. When I went up to the window, the man said, Thank goodness, we have been looking for mob stuff all morning, and you are just the type. I started to show him the clipping about winning the beauty prize, but he said, I haven't time for post-mortems now. Come around Sunday. He must have made a mistake in the day, for no one works Sunday. He gave me a card, and then the girl I was with led me inside. My, but it was a big place. There were a lot of buildings with carpenters working inside, making scenery and then the big long stage I told you about, where lots of people were working at acting. But we did not stop there, but went on around a hill to where the animals are. Clarabel, they have a regular circus. Elephants, lions, and tigers, and the cutest monkeys. They take the animal pictures in a big steel cage, and the man with the camera and the director stand outside and tell the animals inside what to do. The only chances the director ever takes is catching a cold. We did not have time to stop long at the animals, for the man came dashing along and said, Beat it to where you belong. We went over in front of a building, and there was Mr. Kerrigan. He just looked so proud and handsome, every inch an actor. Mr. Cheney, the director, and the cameraman, climbed up on a platform, and us extra people were herded over on the other side of the street by some fresh assistant director. Now, Jack, the director called, you know what to do when the mob comes on. You grab the girl in your arms, don't get excited and choke her, and then defy the mob to do their worst. You extra people, meaning me and the others, come up the street as if you were going to tear the girl to pieces, but stop when Kerrigan raises his hand and register fear and anger. Now let's try it. I don't think much of the leading woman, Clarabelle, and between us, I could have done much better. She didn't act a bit. She didn't wave her hands and grab her heart and yell, Spare me, spare me! And she was afraid of us, too. I could tell that by the way she ran up the street and hid behind Jack. If they had let me play that part, I would have shown them. I would have let down my hair and really done something. Mr. Cheney didn't like it either, for he said, Rotten, try it again, and I want you extra people to come after her as if you meant it. Don't stop to comb your hair. I hadn't stopped to comb my hair at all, Clarabelle. I merely paused to fix one wayward tress that was tickling my nose, so I could not register fear or anger or both together. I would like to know how you could register fear or anger either, for that matter while you were running as fast as your skirts would let you up the street. My book and elocution said to register fear by advancing the left foot and placing the hands, palm outward, in front of the face. But every time I stopped to do it, someone stepped on my heels and pushed me along. It was the most impolite mob I ever heard of. A lot of low people who never had any dramatic training. And that director, when I was doing my best, right up near Miss Sisson, and was acting all over the place, he calls to his assistant and says, Al, Put that lens louse in the background. We have to have some of the principals in this scene. I looked into the camera but didn't say anything, and in a minute the fresh assistant come to where I was and asked me to assist those in the rear of the mob. Goodness knows they needed assistance, dear, for all they were doing were waving clubs and shouting. So just to help them out, I went way in the back. When I was back there, Mr. Cheney said, 
There, thank goodness, we can get a mob scene now. Wasn't that a delicate little compliment? After we got through the scene, I went up and thanked him. I started to show my diploma and tell him who I really was, but he said, Don't, dearie. I have had a hard day's work, and I cannot stand another shock. Meaning, of course, Clarabel, that he recognized genius in disguise. Well, dear, I must close now, and next time I will tell you about Mr. Turner shooting black box pictures. Give my love to all. Molly. I notice one of the stars in Keystone spells her name Grace, so here goes mine. End of chapter 2